Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching Weaviate on YouTube. I'm super excited to present the Weaviate Gorilla Project. We fine-tuned the open source Llama 7 billion parameter large language model to translate from natural language commands into the Weaviate GraphQL search APIs. So we're better equipping large language models to use Weaviate by interfacing them with our gorillas. And gorillas are these smaller language models that are specialized on a particular set of API through the use of retrieval aware fine tuning. So this project also has a nice side effect of making it easier for humans to use Weaviate because by translating from natural language commands into Weaviate's GraphQL APIs, it lightens the learning curve a little bit from learning how to do you know, compositional queries and just knowing all the queries that you're able to execute, which is another kind of nice side effect of this project is it serves as a query router. There's a lot of interesting uh, discussion about combining SQL queries with vector search and the gorilla has a nice kind of off the shelf effect of it takes the natural command and it routes it to whether the Weaviate aggregate query, which is how we do symbolic aggregations like SQL style, or the get query as well as these nice trick shots where you can do a vector search and then do symbolic aggregations on the results of the uh, vector search. So all sorts of interesting things there. I would say with this project, if you're curious about the future of LLMs and tool use, I would kind of say software broadly. If you have a set of APIs and you want to see how we did it, how we use self-instruct prompting to generate a training data set, how we fine-tuned Llama 7B using Hugging Face's amazing PEF library, and then Substratus orchestrating uh, Kubernetes and K8's training, as well as you know visualizing the results and how we're thinking about evaluating this kind of thing. So really quick, one more thing that we'll get into in the discussion, but I wanna quickly present in the introduction, is the impact that this might have on software integrations. We can imagine a natural language command, build a question answering system using Llama Index and Weaviate visualized in Streamlit, and similarly to how you know Code Interpreter on OpenAI is able to just you give it a file and say make me a graph of this, we're pretty we're getting pretty close to LLMs that write code and use specific libraries like Weaviate and all these kind of things. So I think this is such an exciting project. I had so much fun working on this. Let's dive into it. This video will explain the Weaviate Gorilla project. Continuing on the introduction with a bit more of a visual flair, the high-level idea is LLM tool use, connecting large language models with external tools that allow them to supercharge their capabilities and be more productive generally. So for example, if we want to answer the question, what's the weather like in Boston right now, there's no way that we can rely on language modeling the internet or even reinforcing learning from human feedback to answer a question like this. The emerging solution to questions like this is to connect large language models with third-party APIs. So we have our large language model and then we have some kind of weather API. In order for the large language model to talk to the weather API, it needs to format its request in the API compatible way. So this API may have input arguments like city, where it expects a string like Boston, Massachusetts, Maybe it expects a zip code, and so you would have the zip code, and it needs to learn to format the request in this particular syntax. So if it expects the string Boston, Massachusetts, for example, and instead the large language model says 02210, the API may be unable to respond, as well as processing, say, the date argument. So APIs have a particular kind of syntax that they expect, and we need to get our large language models to follow this syntax. The API example may be, uh, the weather example might be a little simple, but you can imagine with Weaviate, we have more complex APIs than that. So the general idea is connecting large language models to all these external tools to supercharge it, keep its knowledge up to date, as well as to let it execute uh, computation. So we connect LLMs to calculators or code executors, search engines or databases, as well as things like weather APIs or say your personal calendar as LLMs are becoming our co-pilots and assistants in our lives. So let's dive into Weaviate as a tool for large language models. In this project, we already assume that we have a Weaviate instance running with a data schema and data loaded into it, and we're learning how to format API requests, search requests to this running database. Later in the discussion, we'll discuss the more open-ended idea of letting large language models create new classes, populate new data, and all those exciting directions. So let's say we have some kind of natural language command with a pretty complex Weaviate query. What is the average complexity level of yoga poses that are similar to warrior pose with a maximum distance of 0 0.15? We translate this into the Weaviate query where we use aggregate our yoga pose class, we use vector search, and then we use a symbolic aggregation to get the average complexity of the results from our vector search. So this is a bit of a confusing query that I don't think a lot of new Weaviate users know you can do this, 
as well as other things like this. So the general idea is to let you translate from natural commands into these queries. So we needed to generate a training data set that takes in these natural commands, the API reference for this composition of aggregate vector search and then calculating the mean of the results of a particular property in the Weavia class we returned, as well as the custom schema for yoga pose, which has properties such as this complexity level, as well as some vectorized property that's letting us vector search warrior pose. So as is maybe already evident, making it easier for large language models to use tools also makes it easier for humans to use them. So this is a proposal for the auto API where we take a natural language query like show me the full name and email of contacts that contain John and their full name. And then under the hood, the WeV8 GraphQL Gorilla will translate this into the proper GraphQL query using your schema as well as the API reference, and then execute the query, also giving you the option to visualize the generated query using the following syntax. So we'll talk about the auto API proposal a bit later in the video. In addition, I think this video will be interesting to anyone out there who's wondering, how do I fine tune an LLM for my API? So whether you have a set of APIs and you wanna also facilitate this natural language command to using your software, I think you'll be interested in this project. So let's dive into the overview of everything we did to create this model. Here's everything we did to train the Weavegate GraphQL Gorilla in a two minute overview. We begin with four data sets. We have a knowledge base where we have synthetic database schemas. We give GPT-4 a prompt on what a WeVA database schema looks like, as well as asking it to write at least two text properties, at least one integer number property, as well as at least one Boolean property and at least one cross reference from this class to another class. We create 50 such toy schemas from cars to instruments <laughs> to all sorts of things. So then we have our knowledge base of API references. This contains all of the APIs in Weaviate, hybrid search, where, auto cut, re-ranking, 46 such APIs, some of which are atomic, for example, BM25 only describing BM25, as well as some compositional API references like how to use BM25 in tandem with the where filter. Then we have task examples. These are manually written examples of how to translate from an API reference and a, uh, a custom schema into a new query, as well as how to translate from a custom schema, API reference and query into a natural language command, because we're gonna be generating uh, synthetic examples to then train with. So the first thing we do is we take the knowledge base of uh, synthetic database schemas and API references, as well as the example of how to do this task, and we create new queries by looping through all of the database schemas and all of the APIs. So now we've created 2,300 new queries for these synthetic schemas. We then use this to create natural language commands for when someone would want to execute these queries. So now we have, this is the entirety of the self-instruct al algorithm. Now we have these two data sets of queries as well as the natural commands for when we would want to execute these queries. We also can use these uh, this natural language command set to evaluate retrieval. We'll put the natural language command as our query and we'll see if it's able to return the API reference that was used to produce the synthetic natural language command and synthetic query. We then take the new queries and the natural language commands and we template this into our fine tuning data. So in the fine tuning data, the input will be the synthetic database schema, the retrieved API reference, as well as the synthetic natural language command and we'll predict the synthetic query. We use this in substratus orchestrating Kubernetes and K8's training, also using the Hugging Face PEF library to train our Gorilla large language model. We then evaluate our Gorilla large language model by firstly simply asking, does it execute in Weaviate by looping through the schemas, instantiating them in Weaviate, and then uh, even if you don't have any data in Weaviate, if you execute a query, uh, if you give it an incorrectly formatted query, it will give you an error message. Otherwise, it will just you know give you an empty list of results. So we can test quickly if the query executed. Uh, we also use LLM evaluation, which is where you uh, give an instruction response pair to GPT-4 and you ask it, did this response follow the instruction? You can similarly try to maybe correct the response by using things like reflection prompting, but this is another way to get evaluation metric off the shelf. Uh, we can also use the perplexity metric where we see, uh, you know, we force the language model to generate the ground truth queries. There is a bit of variance in the queries for, for some of them that might make this difficult as well as the n-gram match. So we'll talk more about evaluation later in the presentation. Really quickly before we dive further into the details of self-instruct prompting and how we train these models and evaluated them, here is the proposal for the auto API. So if you have a second, I'd really appreciate it if you could check out this API. Uh, let us know if 
firstly, you like the way that this looks, if this is something that would be useful to you, as well as some of the details of particularly how we would package this, if, if that makes sense. So overall, this is the idea of having an auto API where you could just give a natural language query, and then you could see the generated query as well as under the hood, auto would translate and then execute the query. So there's all sorts of details in this about how exactly we would serve the Weaviate Gorilla model, how exactly we will do the retrieval aware inference. So if you have a second, please leave a thumbs up if you think this would be interesting. It really helps us prioritize what to work on. So thank you so much for checking this out. So diving further into how we train the Weaviate GraphQL Gorilla, we're gonna cover four main parts, self-instruct data generation, fine-tuning Llama 7b, evaluating the model, and then discussion and next steps for the Gorilla project. So beginning with self-instruct data generation. So we start off by creating synthetic schemas for all sorts of fictional Weaviate use cases. We do this by prompting GPT-4. Here's an example of a Weaviate database schema. And then we give it an example of the JSON for a manually written schema. Then we give it information about Weaviate classes and properties, just describing how classes are the atomic abstraction for some kind of object. And then it has these associated properties and then some information about properties, like how they can be text. You specify one text property to vectorize the object, as well as you know, int properties, Boolean, and then cross-references from classes to other classes, such as book, has author, author being another class. So then we prompt it, could you please design five more fictional schemas? For each, could you please include at least two text properties, at least one inner number property, at least one Boolean property, and at least one cross-reference for the cross-reference class, can you please create that class as well with at least one text property and at least one in property? So this lets us then uh, generate synthetic cross-reference classes where say we uh, we search through books, then we get the author, and then we wanna see, uh, let's say the average, let's say you wanna do a symbolic query on the author that you've linked this way, and you wanna say the average uh, number of books they've written or something like that. So we, we can do this kind of thing by adding these properties and making sure that each of these synthetic schemas are able to cover an exhaustive set of then synthetic queries. So for this step, I currently did it by just manually looking through the schemas to make sure each one was uh, correct because an error here would cascade severely into the rest of the data. The result of prompting GPT-4 like this is that we end up with 50 synthetic schemas. So for example, here we have a book class, a description, a book from the library, uh, configuring the HNSW vector index, uh, the model that we want to use, in this case the Hugging Face Transformers, to vectorize each uh, book object in our class, as well as the properties. So we have title, the text property, summary, a text property, uh, page count in is available boolean, and then author, the cross-reference to the author class. So we generate 50 such synthetic use cases of Weaviate across all sorts of different applications of Weaviate, from music to video games to, say, clothing, uh, travel destinations, or even AI models themselves. We generate all sorts of synthetic use cases that we can then use to create these synthetic queries and then have training data for our gorilla model. So overall, it takes about two hours to generate 2,300 queries, and this costs about $12 using the, um, uh, in this case, we're, sorry, we're, we're using GBT4 in the, the GUI to generate the synthetic schemas, and then we plug the synthetic schemas into a uh, prompt template with the API references and an example of how to write a query for a custom schema into the prompt. So, there are, I'd say the interesting thing here is that there are two knowledge sources, the API reference and the custom schema, as well as a task example. Task examples, a few shot examples, kind of got swept under the rug a little bit with the whole RLHF thing, but I would say it is paramount to the success of this project, is using examples of tasks can supercharge this kind of prompting. So I highly recommend you know whatever you're doing with large language model prompting to add examples of the task you're trying to complete. So, so then this takes two hours to loop through the 50 synthetic schemas, the 46 APIs, and generate 2,300 queries, costing about $12 using the OpenAI uh, GBT 3.5 16K API. So here's some future directions for the data creation. So firstly, uh, validating the queries. So we can you know, loop through each of the schemas, load in the JSON, create the Weaviate schema, and then execute the query. But I think you want to have a way of doing this asynchronously doing this in the background where you generate the queries on one thread and then you are validating the queries somewhere else so it doesn't block the program and slow this down because uh, two hours isn't super fast and you don't want to be adding that extra layer in there that could you know blow it up so another way to get more data would be 
to add the previous example again. So you'd say, you know, here's the previous example of a query generated. And also if that did validate, that would be a really great query. And what that would result in is diversity in the uh, kind of query sent, uh, the kind of filters used if you're prompting it to write a custom where filter, as well as which properties it then accesses from the query. Uh, so another interesting thing is thinking about atomic and compositional APIs. So this is quite a deep topic where with Weavey 8, um, for example, you can combine BM25 with where, as well as other features like using underscore additional to get the vector of the object. So thinking about whether, so we have 46 APIs, but it's not exactly, uh, that's not the combinatorics of all the compositional APIs that you could do from the set of the atomic APIs. So we could probably create even more documentation synthetically through generative feedback loops by uh, combining our atomic APIs where appropriate and then creating more documentation on how you might combine all sorts of APIs, particularly from this perspective of uh, Gorilla. So now that we have our training data set created by self-instruct prompting using the API references, synthetic database schemas, and task examples, we can now fine tune the LAMA 7 billion parameter large language model. So to do this, we teamed up with Substratus AI and particularly Sam Stalinga really led all this. I'm gonna do my best to kind of explain his work on this. So we begin by loading the parameters for Hugging Face's uh, language model fine tuner. We'll see this later. Uh, then we uh, load in the model. We, we already have this model saved in our directory where we've saved, you, you do the dot from pre-train and you have the llama 7 billion, which is pretty straightforward to figure out how you do that on, um, on Hugging Face. Uh, so this is one interesting detail. I'm not sure if I have this completely correct, but I think what you do is you load the model in 8-bit precision. And then I think once it gets into memory, then you convert it back to float 16. I'm not sure exactly how that, if that's correct, but uh, so then we load our data set and again our uh, I don't know if I've said this in the video yet but our this data set is open sourced on uh, we uh, hugging face so then here's the prompt that we use we put in the instruction and then the response is the completion and this is what you use to pass to hugging faces uh, fine tuner so then we have our model we have the uh, config for our model things like the position embeddings the max length from the model uh, then we add this the special padding token with the you know the open square brackets capital letters pad uh, then we tokenize the data set uh, with the max length and then the padding, truncating sequences that are too long. Okay, so then we have our data set. Now we're going to use this incredible PEFT library. So uh, one of the most interesting things that are happening in deep learning is sparse fine tuning. When we fine tune something like Llama 7B, we don't need to update 7 billion parameters. Rather, we can up update a subset of the parameters. And there are quite a few algorithms for <laughs> What, how exactly you update the few parameters. LoRa low rank adaptation is one way where you do a matrix factorization and you only need to update the eigenvalues of this matrix factorization. So it's a bit tricky, but it is one of the most interesting ways of having this you know, vector that's sparse relative to all the parameters. As you see, we have uh, 6.7 billion parameters in Llama, and we only need to train 8 million of the parameters by using this sparse fine-tuning uh, thing with LoRa, which is interface with Hugging Face. And you know, I say this a lot on the podcast and stuff. I feel like Hugging Face has created such an incredible library, also Mosaic ML. They've made it so much like, uh, they've abstracted so much of this, and it works pretty well that I personally don't find myself feeling like I need to invest into unpacking the details of these kind of things. But unless that's your thing, obviously, then then dive into it. But anyway, so so now that we have our model set up and the training data set, now we use the data collator for language modeling. So right now with Weavey Gorilla, we're just language modeling by using that. Um, you When you give it this prompt template, uh, sorry, this prompt te template shown here, it will only language model the completion part instead of the instruction as well, which is kind of a nice effect of this. And it'll also do things like... Um, you know, back in the day with Hugging Face language modeling, you would just basically concatenate all the text you had into one gigantic text file and it would just randomly sample from that. But this is doing, it has more stuff now on uh, separating each uh, input output example from each other. Uh, so, so then once we train the model, you can see our loss curves that we'll visualize in a second. Okay, so as shown in the notebook, now I grab that, uh, the training loss and steps, drop that into a text file and give it to OpenAI's code interpreter, which I feel like is a neighbor to our gorilla project here, and asked it to visualize this data. So we see this learning curve. You always have some variance in learning curves, but generally we see this uh, decreasing loss. And 
this is quite lazy. We, you know, we only have the training loss for now. It would be good to show that overfitting curve where you also have the test loss and you see if the test loss is decreasing with the training loss. But for now, we just wanted to, you know, get running with having fit a model. But we do, when we're showing you some results at the end of the, uh, the presentation as well as the blog post, those are from held out uh, schemas and API references. And we have done some train test splitting, just but we've just manually inspected it instead of having it in our uh, quantitative evaluation loop. So with concluding, here are some ideas I have about fine tuning these kind of models. So firstly, in a new podcast that we're going to be releasing on Wednesday, Farshad Farabakhshian describes this idea of skill versus knowledge and giving the example of a lawyer for how to think about, for one class of thinking about fine tuning. In this way of thinking, you are a lawyer and you have the skill of how to parse these legal documents. You know, like me personally, if you gave me, if I had, had all these legal documents and I was your lawyer, you would be in trouble. But a lawyer who's been to law school has fine tuned in a way to have the skill of reading the, the knowledge. So you have the retrieval augmented generation to provide the knowledge as well as learning the skill for how to parse the knowledge. And I think that's one really strong way of thinking about fine tuning. You've always had this kind of argument around domain specific knowledge, like the idea that you would need to take uh, the GPT-3 language model on the internet and then fine tuning it on medical information. That idea has been around forever and I think that's very similar to the lawyer example, but now we're seeing this new one of tool use. So the exciting thing about tool use, and I think one of our interesting research questions here, is how much can we compress this gorilla model? Because the Llama 7 billion parameter model is cheaper to serve than these you know, massive 200 billion plus parameter large language models. So how far can we compress it to using to translating natural language commands into the GraphQL APIs? And this would make it make the whole thing cheaper, more economical, and let it do several generations, like unlocking all this kind of uh, like tree of thoughts, planning, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so now let's dive into some results of our WeVA GraphQL Gorilla. So taken from the natural language command, and again, we so we have a few training runs. There are a few models. If you go to Hugging Face and you look at the models on Substratus AI, these are models that have done the train test split, and we're looking at novel uh, API references as well as schemas. So what this means is that in this case, we have a contact, you know, like this is like the contact schema and we're generating a new query. So in this case, just a single where filter, this is the new query that's being shown. But in this case, we still have, we, it still has probably seen the where filter in the training data set, but in some kind of compositional API, or I think actually there are two API references, one for the like operator particularly. So that could be the case as well. But anyway, so it takes the query, Show me the full name and email of contacts that contain John in their full name, and it formats the WeVA query using the proper get syntax. Proper and so here's so there are a couple of things to this. So firstly, it knows the names of all the arguments. You know where is how you do the filter path, full name being the property, the like operator, and then it correctly does you know John asterisks for how you would do the full name uh, John in their full name, and then it's accessing these properties. It's correctly closing the square brackets. Uh, the curly brackets and all these kinds of details for how you send an API request that will execute on the database. Here's another example of a more complex query. So get me instruments with a hybrid search of piano, cutting results off with the first steep drop in the hybrid search score and show the name description you're introduced and whether it is a string instrument and the name and genre of the players. So now we're doing the composition of hybrid with AutoCut. So what AutoCut does, as mentioned in the natural language description, it stops showing search results once they are no longer good according to the slope in vector distance. So we see how it's able to combine hybrid with AutoCut as well as do this cross-reference for the players of the instrument. So, you know, played by name genre. So this I think is a great example of how it's combining all sorts of things about WeV8's GraphQL interface to write these kind of queries from a natural description. Okay, so now let's dive into one of my favorite side effects of the Gorilla and this training data set is Gorilla as an off-the-shelf SQL versus vector search query router. So for example, when we ask it the natural language command, show me the number of courses, the Gorilla is able to translate it to aggregate course meta count instead of just doing some kind of vector search query. So it's able to differentiate between aggregate and get and let you plug in these two different kinds of categories. Now, here is something that I really like, is combining vector search with aggregate queries. What is the average complexity level of yoga poses that are similar to warrior pose with a maximum distance of 0.15? What this lets you do is search for the nearest neighbors to warrior pose in the vector space, 
and then do a symbolic aggregation on the data points in that vector space. So I presented this at ODSC London in 2022. I love using this for, say, uh, Twitter analytics. It's just something that I use in my life where you have all these tweets and you want to know things like, you know, what is the average link clicks? Do people like these kind of tweets? And rather than having to categorize your tweets, you can just give it a natural language query like tweets about new papers or maybe tweets about new LLM papers and it can filter it and then you can do these symbolic queries. So I love seeing that Gorilla is able to do this kind of thing from a natural command. I'm so, so excited about this SQL vector query router provided from natural language commands. Okay, so although you've seen some good examples, what do bad examples look like? Now this is a query from Gorilla that will not execute because it's missing a comma between BM25 and where. So it's the little details like this, maybe hallucinating an operator or giving an incorrect, uh, say giving a string for value number or a property that doesn't exist. These are the kind of hallucinations that would cause this to fail. So let's step a little more into how we plan to graduate our evaluation of these models. So firstly, there's sort of the does it execute thing that, that this query would fail, but you still could have cases where the query executes, but it doesn't follow the instructions. So one interesting strategy for doing this, obviously there would be a lot of human annotation that went into projects like this in the past, but we could maybe use the higher capacity GPT-4 model and prompt it with does the response follow the instructions. Another interesting idea is reflection prompting, where you use that kind of reflection to maybe correct the response. So did it follow the instructions? No. How would you fix it? And that might be another way to fix the queries then and get them back into the training data or something like that, or have some kind of sampling mechanism like that. A couple other more quantitative metrics we can do, ground truth perplexity. That's one of the most common metrics you see, and I think that works pretty well where you force, uh, force sorry, <laughs> the language model to uh, output the ground truth uh, synthetic query. And there's also an n-gram match where there's an interesting idea where, for example, if we're doing this kind of BM25 where thing, we would see how many of the keywords it matches with get, job listing, BM25 query. So we could do something like this also to see how well it followed the uh, particular API reference. So here are some of the research questions we have about our WeVA GraphQL Gorilla as well as the future of this project. So firstly, the most important practical question, does WeVA GraphQL Gorilla generalize to new schemas? As we plug this model into the auto API trained on our data set of fictional schemas, is it going to generalize to your schema? To measure this, we're train test splitting our synthetic schemas into train tests but they're into 40 training, 10 testing, but there are other kind of ideas we can do like controlling the variance of how many text properties, whether there's an in property, things like this to add more coverage to our data set to hopefully you can put it in the training data and it corrects it that way, but also at least we have some kind of metric, some kind of ability to see where it's failing. The next interesting question, especially with the maintenance of this model, is does WeVA GraphQL Gorilla generalize to new APIs? Let's say uh, the auto <laughs> introducing the new auto API might be a little too meta, but let's say we introduce a re-ranker that takes in symbolic properties to do the re-ranking to something like XGBoost, like some kind of new search API in WeVA. Will, do we need to retrain this model or by using retrieval aware training, is it gonna be able to just be able to read the new API reference and write the new queries? So I think it's quite promising. This is one of the biggest appeals of retrieval aware training is by putting the API reference in the input, the model is learning to read the API reference and that might help with the maintenance and continual learning of this model. The next big question is a bit more, it's a bit more academic, but it's very practical in this setting is atomic and compositional APIs. So the, the reason I say it's academic is this idea of compositional generalization is one of the most interesting things in deep learning. That avocado shaped armchair the reason that's so popular is because you're combining the concepts of avocado shape with armchair and then creating this new image in the Dolly models case. So in our case, a compositional API would be, uh, you know, combining BM25 with where with say auto cut as well. And imagining whether our data set should only be atomic APIs with some examples of the compositionality and what kind of compositionality does it generalize to. The next big question is retrieval evaluation. This is one of the biggest findings from the original Gorilla paper from Shashir Patel, Tian Jun Zhang, and collaborators is showing that when they don't have the Oracle context in their fine-tuned Gorilla model, the performance degrades quite severely. So how do we get the best retrieval for our WeV8 GraphQL Gorilla? This has actually been one of the most eye-opening lessons for me in this project 
is in this case, we have 46 APIs, and I think it's better to classify which API you wanna use rather than doing the embedding similarity. Now, the interesting thing with this is scale, of course. So, you know, when I only have 46 APIs, I can easily manage this, you know, classification data set where I train the classifier to go from the natural language commands to the API. But if I scaled this and we imagine, say, 5,000 APIs, then I imagine retrieval is gonna be quite important. But it really shows the value of having these symbolic where filters and how that can help improve relevance in retrieval. So I think this is gonna be one of the most interesting questions with building these models further. The next interesting question related to this is the robustness of the WeV8 GraphQL Gorilla to noisy retrieval. So, you know, say we try to correct our retrieval by retrieving three results rather than just one, is Gorilla still gonna be able to parse that out and use the correct reference from the three search results? As we saw from the lost in the middle paper, it doesn't look like this is gonna be uh, super easy to just correct retrieval errors by retrieving more results. The next big question is the robustness of the WeV8 GraphQL Gorilla to paraphrases of the, of the natural language commands to then trigger the generation of the GraphQL. So for example, our GPT-3.5, GPT sorry, that is being prompted to generate the natural language commands, it might have a particular kind of style in tone, like get me the, show me the, and then it follows this particular thing of, maybe it has the search parameters first, followed by the properties it wants to see, how robust is this gonna to be to super casual natural language commands for retrieving from your database or you know, in increasingly formal requests. So we can similarly use self-instruct and GPT-4 and so on these large language, like the, you know, the largest large language models, seven billion is also quite large, but to have paraphrases of the natural language commands, see what happens by either adding that to our training data set or adding that to our testing evaluation. So following the presentation of these research questions, here's a discussion of how I see the space of WeV8 and Gorilla, generally the Gorilla idea of fine tuning LLMs to use particular tools. So the first thing I'm keeping an eye on is the development of the Gorilla open source repository, Gorilla an API store for LLMs. So I've done a paper summary video diving into the original exploration of Gorilla that explores this really interesting thing of formatting APIs for deep learning models. So in this case, the natural language command would be something that indicates whether you wanna use uh, an image segmentation model, say an image generation model, or maybe a, a you know, sentiment classification text model from the Hugging Face Model Hub, Torch Hub, TensorFlow Hub, and routing this into formatting the correct API request. So WeV8, firstly, is quite related to this, where you know, if you wanna do some embedding search, which is a deep learning model thing, you also need this kind of infrastructure of building up a vector index, which makes it a unique kind of model inference problem in this category. So my big question with adding uh, WeV8 to the API Zoo in the Gorilla project is uh, how we want to interface the class and the property. So a common thing you see in, in like Langchain or Llama index is you just call the class like document and then you have a text key content. And so you just kind of interface those two and then you just interface the, uh, the vector search. But I'll be really interested to see what happens as different kinds of APIs are added to this Gorilla thing, and more on this shortly. The next super interesting thing will be extending WeV8 GraphQL Gorilla to WeV8 Python Gorilla, WeV8 JavaScript Gorilla, WeV8 Java Gorilla, WeV8 Go Gorilla. So WeV8, in addition to this GraphQL uh, API, also has programming language clients. So for example, to do the same kind of uh, where filter in Python, you can do client.query.withWhere and pass it in this Python dictionary. You can also do client.query.raw and pass in the string of the GraphQL query is one way of doing this in Python. But the thing about Python that opens, you know, opens the whole Gorilla project up to probably its more exciting, uh, you know, general scope is allowing uh, it to create classes, to import data, to do things like um, adding cross references or maybe the cloud management stuff like replication, configuring multi-tenancy, all this kind of stuff, because once you open it up to WeV8 Python Gorilla, now it has all the levers it needs to control the WeV8 vector database. Now here's what I think is the really exciting future of Gorillas, and I think seeing maybe the Python Gorilla and kind of the vision of what that could be, how it handles creating the schema, connecting to the client, you know, maybe if you're running WeV8 embedded, it can instantiate all of WeV8, but importing data as well as the querying, I think this really opens up what we can do with these APIs. And probably the most interesting thing to me at least is how this will change software integration.
So imagine a natural language command where you say, build a llama index query engine with WeV8 from my Notion workspace titled Biochemistry Chapter 4. Now, it will just take that and do everything you need to create this kind of technology for you because the gorillas know how to use the APIs to achieve each of these parts. Now we can imagine level two adding to the level one prompt, please chunk the text with unstructured and vectorize the chunks with OpenAI embeddings. Please add a Cohere re-ranker and Mosaic ML's MPT 30 billion large language model. Please create a visualization of the system in Streamlit. We can maybe imagine also saying, please visualize the embeddings using Arise AI or Nomic AI. So there's, there's so much we can imagine to adding all this software together through natural language commands. So the question to me though of how, how do we get there isn't quite clear yet. I think there are three general kind of pathways. We have one, WeV8 maintains one gorilla where we generate all the training data, manage the model for all the integrations that we've particularly you know, decided to include in our training data set. So that would mean you know, like we have, a, we have coding examples of how to use WeV8 with Llama index. And so we've created those synthetic examples and trained our gorilla on it. The second idea could be we have interfaces such that WeV8's gorilla talks to Llama index's gorilla so you know both models know their APIs and maybe they would also have to have some kind of orchestrator that knows what goes to WeV8 and what goes to Llama index and then maybe the third thing is Gorilla emerges as an independent third party that manages all the documentation of these uh, software tools and the APIs and how they connect with each other so I think there definitely is going to need to be some kind of hierarchy some kind of orchestration that knows how to connect these things together as well as the formatting of the particular APIs but as we saw from WeV8 GraphQL's Gorilla's ability to uh, do compositional queries, it might be able to just, you generate a, re a reference of combining like five different things and it might be able to just do that from one query. So I'm super excited about working on the development of this. I think this will have a massive impact on how quickly we can test new ideas. And I really just think it's continuing this theme of LLMs that write code and code interpreter, but using particular libraries. I think that really opens up what this is able to accomplish. So thinking about how WeVA can control the entire database through maybe the Python clients, creating classes, creating new schemas, adding properties, you know, importing data, that might be a little too future lo looking. I think the most immediate thing in front of us is interfacing this WeVA GraphQL gorilla to WeVA users as well as LLMs through the auto API. So if you have a second, please check out the GitHub issue. It really means a lot and let us know what you think about. Uh, just thumbs up if this would be useful to you or if you see any holes in the design of it, any ideas on this presentation. So to conclude with some high level directions for this whole space of LLM tool use, I think we're really seeing the evolution of retrieval augmented generation. From the original conception from Lewis and others where we have this kind of embedding based retrieval to take context and decompose the problem of language modeling into retrieve then read, we're now seeing this use of search databases as a whole entire tool. And I think it's really interesting to read this paper on self-driving database management systems quoted, a true self-driving database management system automatically one, decides what actions to use to optimize itself, two, decides when to deploy those actions, and three, learns from those actions, all without any human intervention. So I think this is quite a bold vision where we can imagine you know, actions to optimize itself, whether it's configuring at the lowest level, the HNSW parameters like the EF construction, the number of neighbors, or with product quantization, how big of segments to use, maybe the precision for the centroid IDs, all these kind of hyperparameters for tuning the search database, as well as actions such as creating new classes, creating new properties. In the case of the generative feedback loops, maybe taking your data, transforming it into new data by prompting LLMs and then saving that data back into your database by using these APIs interfaced with things like the Gorilla algorithm. And I think generally just having these databases that are observing the queries that you're seeing from, I think the original conception of this was say building index structures, like if you're seeing a particular kind of uh, join in an SQL system or a particular kind of filter, you might build up and you know cache these kind of indexes that you're seeing all the time. But now we're seeing, I think, a more open-ended interpretation of that where you also could do things like um, you know create a new class that has a particular kind of data in it and route queries to that. Or say if you go deep into HNSW, there is some research on how you can uh, improve the speed of filtered vector searches by increasing the connectivity of the graph.
But generally, I think by exposing LLMs to these APIs, we're going to see this really interesting evolution of LLMs and these search databases. Thank you so much for watching this presentation of the WeVA GraphQL Gorilla. To connect with us at WeVA, we have a Slack community where everyone on the team, including members of the community, are trying to answer your questions about building semantic search applications. It's I really vouch highly for this community. I think you'll enjoy joining it and asking any questions you have about building systems with WeVA. Next up is the Twitter, LinkedIn, WeVA.io. If you want to keep up with the new developments of WeVA, new releases of the software, as well as blog posts and uh, research projects like this, all these sources will be great for you know keeping up with the information channels of WeVA. And finally, I highly, highly recommend checking out the new Verba Retrieval Augmented Generation with WeVA. This is a full stack demo using you know a React front end as well as the WeVA back end, and it's a really exciting new uh, demo project from WeVA. So please check that out. And thank you so much for watching the WeVA GraphQL Gorilla project.